Hi, room 15. This is chapter 11 called In the Library of Secret of Nim. The tunnel led gently downward and, the after the, and after the first dozen steps, they were in darkness. Mrs. Frisbee could see nothing at all. Behind her, Mr. Aegis limped along. Ahead, she could hear the scuffle of Justin's footsteps. She followed the sound blindly. Then she heard his voice. Just walk straight forward, Mrs. Frisbee. There's nothing to trip over and nothing to bump into. If you get off course, you'll feel the wall. He added, the dark part doesn't last long. Now, what did he mean by that? She thought it would be over for a minute or two as she walked and had just decided to ask him, when to her surprise, she saw ahead of her a faint glow, a light. But how could there be a light down so far? There, we're through it, said Justin cheerfully. I know that blackout bit must be annoying the first time, but it's necessary. But aren't we under the ground? Oh, yes, about three feet down by now, I guess. And how can it be light? I could tell you, Justin said, but if you'll wait 15 seconds, you'll see for yourself. In a few more steps, the tunnel, Mrs. Frisbee could now discern dimly its shape and direction, took a turn to the right, and she did see for herself. She stopped in astonishment. Ahead of her stretched a long, well-lit hallway. Its ceilings and walls were smoothly curved arch, its floor hard and flat, with a soft layer of carpet down the middle. The lights came from the walls, where every foot or so on both sides, a tiny light bulb had been recessed and in and the wall, hole in it which stood, like a small window, had been covered with a square of colored glass, blue, green, or yellow. The effect was at the stained glass windows in sunlight. Justin was watching her and smiling. Don't you like it? The carpet and the colored glass we don't really need. Some of the wives did that on their own, just for looks. They cut the glass, believe it or not, from the old bottles. The carpet was a piece of trim they found somewhere. It's beautiful, said Mrs. Frisbee. But how? We've had electricity for four years now. Five, said Mr. Ages. Five, said Justin, agreeably. The lights, they were very small, very bright, twinkling ones. We found on trees. In fact, most of our lights come from trees. Not until after Christmas, of course, about New Year's. The, light, the big light bulbs we have trouble handling. Mrs. Frizzy was familiar with electricity. Her husband, who knew all kinds of things, had once explained it to her. At night, she had seen the lamps shining in Mr. Fitzgibbon's house, and at Christmas time, the lights that his son strung up on the pine tree outside. You mean you just took them, she asked? We were careful to only take a few from each tree, said Mr. Ages. It was like picking fruit, Justin said rather dreamily, the annual light bulb harvest. We had to go quite far up the road before we had enough. Even so, it took two Christmases. Justin, said Mr. Ages, I think we'd better get on. They continued along the corridor, which curved always slightly to the right, so Mrs. Frisbee could not really tell how long it was, and which soon began to incline more steeply into the ground. Mrs. Frisbee noticed that the air, which should have been dank and damp, so deep underground, was on the contrary fresh and clean, and she thought she could even detect a faint breeze blowing past her ears as she moved. In a few more minutes, the hall widened abruptly into a large oval chamber. Here the lights were set in the ceiling. At the far end, Mrs. Frisbee could see the long tunnel continued and looked as if it were slanted upward again, perhaps to another entrance, a back door. Was this then their destination, the main hall of the rats? And if so, what, where were all the other rats? The room was entirely empty, not even, a stike, not even a stick of furniture. A storeroom, said Justin, sometimes full, but now empty. Then she saw that off on the side of the chamber there was a stairway leading down, and beside it a small door. Justin led them to the door. For freight only, he said with a grin at Mr. Ages, but considering your limp, I think we can make an exception. The stairs wouldn't be very easy. Mrs. Frisbee looked at the stairway. It went down in a spiral, and each step was neatly inlaid with a rectangular piece of slate. She could not tell how far it led down, since after the first turn of the spiral, she could see no more. But she had a feeling it was a long way down. As Justin said, it would be hard for Mr. Ages. Justin opened the door. It led into a square room that looked like a closet. After you, he said. Mrs. Frisbee went in, the others followed, and the door swung shut. Do you guys know what she's in right now? <laughs> On the wall were two knobs. Justin pushed one of them, and Mrs. Frisbee, who had never been in an elevator before, gasped and almost fell as she felt the floor suddenly sink beneath her feet. Justin reached out a hand to study her. To steady her. It's all right, he said. I should have warned you. But we're falling. Not quite. We're going down, but we've got two strong cables and an electric motor holding us. Still, Mrs. Frisbee held her breath during the rest of the descent, until finally the small elevator came to a gentle stop and Justin opened the door. Then she breathed again and looked out. 
The room before her was at least three times as big as the one that they had just left, and corridors radiated from it as many directions as petals from a daisy. Directly opposite the elevator, an open arch led into what looked like a still larger room, seemingly some kind of an assembly hall, for it was a raised platform at one end. And now there were rats, rats by the dozen, rats standing and talking in groups of twos and threes and fours, rats walking slowly, rats hurrying, rats carrying papers. As Mrs. Frisbee stepped from the elevator, it became obvious that strangers were a rarity down there, for the hubbub of the dozen conversations stopped abruptly, and all heads turned to look at her. They did not look hostile, nor were they alarmed, since her two companions were familiar to them, but merely curious. Just as quickly as it had died out, the sound of talking began again. But one of them, oh, as if the rats were too polite to stand and stare, but one of them, a lean rat with a scarred face, left his group and walked toward them. Justin, Mr. Ages, I see we have a guest. He spoke graciously with an air of quiet dignity, and Mrs. Frisbee noticed two things about him. First, the scar on his face ran across his left eye, and over his eye he wore a black patch, fastened by a cord around his head. Second, he carried a satchel, rather like a handbag, but with a strap over his shoulder. A guest whose name you will recognize, said Justin. This is Mrs. Jonathan Frisbee. Mrs. Frisbee, this is Nicodemus. A name I recognize indeed, said the rat called Nicodemus. Mrs. Frisbee, are you perhaps aware of this? Your late husband was one of our greatest friends. You are welcome here. Thank you, said Mrs. Frisbee, but she was more puzzled than ever. In fact, I did not know that you knew my husband, but I am glad to hear it, because I have come to ask for your help. Mrs. Frisbee has a problem, said Mr. Ages, an urgent one. If we can help, we will, said Nicodemus. He asked Mr. Ages, can it wait until after the meeting, an hour? We were just ready to begin again. Mr. Ages considered. An hour will make no difference, I think. Nicodemus said, Justin, show Mrs. Frisbee to the library, where she can be comfortable until the meeting is over. By this time, the last of the other rats assembled, other assembled rats had made their way into a large meeting hall, where they are sat facing the raised platform. Nicodemus followed them. Pulling some papers and a small reading glass from the satchel at his side, he walked to the front of the room. Justin led Mrs. Frisbee in another direction, down a corridor to their left, and again she had the impression of a faint cool breeze against her face. She realized that the corridor she, corridor she had walked up above was merely a long entranceway, and that the halls around her were the rats' living quarters. The one down with just, which Justin led her was lined with doors, one of, them, one of which he opened. In here, he said. The room they entered was big, square, well-lit, and had a faint, musty smell. It's reasonably comfortable, and if you like to read, he gestured at the walls. They were lined with shelves from floor to ceiling, and on the shelves stood, Mrs. Frisbee dredged her memory, books, she said. They're books. Yes, said Justin. Do you read much? Only a little, said Mrs. Frisbee. My husband taught me, and the children, she started to tell him how, laboriously scratching letters into the earth with a stick. It seems so long ago, but Justin was leaving. Excuse me, I've got to go to a meeting. I hate meetings, but this one's important. We're finishing up our schedule for the plan. He produced it, he pronounced it with a capital P. The plan? But he was out the door, closing it gently behind him. Mrs. Frisbee looked around. The room, the library, Nicodemus had called it, had, in addition to its shelves of books, several tables with benches beside them, and on these were stacked with books, some of them open. Books, her husband Jonathan had told her about them. He had taught her and the children to read. The children had mastered it quickly, but she herself could only manage the simplest words. She had thought be perhaps because she was older. He had also told her about electricity. He had known these things, and so it emerged, did the rats. It had never occurred to her until now to wonder how they knew. He had always known so many things, and she had accepted that that was just a matter of course. But who had taught him to read? Strangely, it also emerged that he had known the... Whoops known the rats. Had they taught him? What had been his connection with them? She remembered his long visits with Mr. Ages, and Mr. Ages knew the rats, too. She sighed, perhaps when the meeting was over, and she had a chance to talk to Nicodemus, and he had told him about Timothy, and had told him about Timothy and moving day. Perhaps when that was settled, he could explain all of this to her. She noticed at the rear, far end of the room, a section of wall where there were no bookshelves. There was instead a blackboard covered with words and numbers written in white chalk. There were pieces of chalk and an eraser in a rack at the bottom of it. The blackboard stood near the end of the longest tables. Was a library also used as a classroom? 
When she looked at the blackboard and rather laboriously read what was written, she saw that it was not. It was rather a conference room. At the top of the board in large letters were printed the words, The Plan of the Rats of Men. Dun dun dun, the plan. So that was chapter 11. Go fill out that Google form.